We're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about probability, and it's worth asking, why is probability so important to machine learning? I want to start with this quote from David Hume, that even after the observation of the frequent or constant conjunction of objects, we have no reason to draw any inference concerning any object beyond those of which we have had experience. What he's talking about here is the task of induction. And in particular, he's talking about whether or not we can make predictions about what will happen tomorrow, given what's happened so far. That is, is the past predictive of the future? This is important to us in machine learning because the idea of generalization is that the past is predictive of the future. That is, we really believe that we can look at a bunch of training data and make interesting and useful predictions about data we have never seen before. So why is generalization possible? Well, it's possible because we're willing to commit ourselves to structure in the data that we expect to see again and again. That is to say that in order to generalize, we must make assumptions about the structure of the world. There are many different ways to specify these kinds of assumptions, but one of the most powerful frameworks is the calculus of probabilities. Here's a video from NVIDIA on the task of scene segmentation. This is a critical task for self-driving cars as it's necessary to understand the car's surroundings. Here, pixels are being labeled according to whether or not they're a car or the ground or a person. And of course, the idea is for the car to use this information to get to its destination safely. It's helpful to think about all the different ways that noise and uncertainty can come into play in a problem like this. For example, the sensor readings that the car is receiving might be noisy. This could be due to the sensor itself or a bumpy road or weather conditions or any number of factors. Additionally, the environment itself might have unpredictable dynamics. It might be hard to anticipate exactly what a car or a pedestrian is going to do. Plus, there might be a lot of random things that could happen, like you could blow a tire or a stop sign could get knocked over. Then there might be uncertainty in what the optimal parameters should be due to limited training data. The car should probably stop if an elephant suddenly runs out into the road, but how many times have you seen that in your training data? And of course, on top of that, it's not like your model is the perfect representation of the real dynamics of the world. In the self-driving car example, it's not like you can build a complete theory of mind of all of the other drivers on the road. Then, even if you could write down some amazing model for the entire world and had an unlimited amount of data, on the car, you still have a limited amount of computation in order to make predictions. Finally, even if you have tons of data and have built a fantastic model, the environment itself might change and you need to adapt. It turns out that it's very helpful to reason about a lot of these processes in terms of random variables and probability. Even in relatively straightforward classification settings, we still like to talk about probabilities. For example, imagine building a simple image classifier for animals. It's helpful both at training time and at testing time to be able to represent its predictions in terms of probabilities. Rather than saying definitely a cat or definitely a dog, instead, these kinds of classifiers put probability distributions over the different possible labels. Ideally then, when encountering a legitimately ambiguous piece of data, the classifier can represent its uncertainty. Regression provides another way to think about this. Imagine that we're trying to model some true function represented by this dashed line. We've observed three data represented by the black circles. Given that we only have three observations, there are many different functions that could explain these data. Rather than commit ourselves to only one function, it's helpful to try to represent all the possible functions that are supported by the evidence. Then, when we make predictions, we account for all of these possible explanations of the world. It turns out, too, that this provides us with a really nice way to update old information with new observations. And ideally, we'd be able to boil all of these hypotheses off into distributions over things we might see at new locations. Here I'm illustrating this as isocontours of a predictive distribution conditioned on the three observed points. That's just a few of the ways that probability informs supervised learning, but there's plenty more. For example, a large amount of machine learning is really maximum likelihood estimation of a conditional probability. On the more theoretical side, a lot of the guarantees that we achieve in machine learning arise from the framework of empirical risk minimization. As yet another example, you've been hearing a lot about deep learning. Well, deep learning depends significantly on stochastic optimization for it to work. Finally, a lot of the most famous theoretical results are based on the idea of pack bounds, where pack stands for probably approximately correct. Most of those examples are about supervised learning. In unsupervised learning, probabilistic modeling is even more important. In fact, many unsupervised learning algorithms really boil down to density estimation. If you've heard about people talking about generative modeling or things called generative adversarial networks, well, what they were talking about was modeling a probability distribution from data and then sampling from it to get new kinds of data. Those faces on the left aren't faces of anyone real. They are samples from a probability distribution that was learned from data. On the right is an illustration of a similar kind of idea applied to small molecules. The idea is to be able to train a model on a large data set of, say, successful drugs, and then sample from that model to invent new kinds of molecules. This particular figure is taken from the recent work of one of my students, Ari Seff, 
who was also a TA of this course. Random variables also provide a powerful framework for thinking about latent structure in data. There are many, many examples of this kind of modeling, but here are three just from my own work with applications in neuroscience, astronomy, and sports analytics. In neuroscience, we use latent variable models to capture behavior and then connect that to neural activity. In astronomy, we use latent variable models to capture the properties of remote light sources like galaxies, for which we only have weak and noisy observations. And in sports analytics, latent variables give us a way to think about the characteristics of different players. Here, in work by my former student Andy Miller, you can see how the shooting patterns of NBA players can be broken down into latent factors. Player skill estimation in online video games provides another fun example of probabilistic latent variable modeling. You'd like to estimate player skill in order to match people up so that they have a good time. However, the outcomes of the games are noisy, and in multiplayer games, you only get weak information about the individual skill levels. Probabilistic models are used to estimate skill for games played by millions of people every day. Another important area of machine learning is sequential decision making. We can understand a lot of different AI type tasks as sequential decision making under uncertainty. When playing a game, for example, you don't know what your opponent's move is going to be. When you're navigating, you may not know exactly where you are. And when you're making financial trades, you don't know how the market is going to move. In robotics, you may not have a perfect model of the kind of objects that you're trying to manipulate. In all of these cases, we not only use probabilities to describe noise in the world and stochastic dynamics, but we also use random variables to describe our own uncertainty about the state of things. So even though it may not be obvious at first, probability is totally fundamental to machine learning. You're going to want to take the time to understand as much probability as you can.